the open door. Jim Hannick here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today we discuss brain death and the termination of actual death. The topic brings us to the heart of what it is to respect the dignity of the human being. It is particularly timely since the Uniform Law Commission is currently studying the possibility of revising the 40-year-old Uniform Determination Death Act. That's the Uniform Determination of Death Act, uh, UDDA. Our special guest is Alan Schumann, MD. He is Professor Emeritus of Neurology and Pediatrics at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Recently, he authored a statement on how not to revise the Universal Determination of Death Act, although revision is in order. Let's begin, as we always do, in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and never rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. I'm going to begin in a way at the beginning, just what is the universal, sorry, I need to begin at the beginning, just what is the uniform determination of death act? And let me add to that. Uh, what exactly is the Uniform Law Commission? Um, okay, well, I'm no expert in legal matters, uh, so I would uh, defer to somebody who's more expert about what is the Uniform Law Commission. Uh, but the, the uh, Uniform Determination of Death Act was... Um, proposed in 1981 by the Uniform Law Commission. Um, and the reason that it came about is that for uh, about 13 years uh, up till then, uh, there had been chaos uh, in the legal statutory definition of death across the country. So in 1968, the Harvard uh, Committee on Brain Death uh, revolutionized uh, this whole field by proposing a new definition of death, uh, which was uh, the complete cessation of all, uh, not only brain activity, but uh, in their opinion, spinal cord activity as well. And uh, that coincided with uh, the uh, groundbreaking uh, first heart transplant by Christian Barnard. So there was this uh, meeting of, of uh, circumstances, confluence of circumstances around that time that um, made everyone very interested in redefining the statutory definition of death so that, uh, especially so that um, vital organs could be transplanted without uh, the surgeons being uh, held legally liable for killing the patient. So the first state to change its statutory definition of death was Kansas in 1971. And there was a kind of domino effect after that where uh, a number of states 
uh, redefined their statutory definitions uh, in, along some neurological criterion. So the problem was uh, run, uh, getting up to 1981, the problem was that uh, every state was doing it differently. And so you could be dead in one state and alive in another state. And this was not a very good state of affairs across the country. So the Uniform Law Commission and uh, the President's uh, Commission, uh, which was uh, a multidisciplinary group uh, consisting of uh, doctors and philosophers and ethicists and lawyers, uh, appointed by the president at that time, uh, studied this whole topic of uh, the definition of death and the criteria for it and the optimal uh, legal statute for it. And uh, so they came out with the, what is known as the Uniform Determination of Death Act which was not a federal law, but it was a template uh, with the hopes that states, uh, the remaining states anyway, would use that template uh, to draft their own state statutory laws about death. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, in pretty short order after that, all the rest of the states uh, revised their statutory definitions of death along the lines of the Uniform Determination of Death Act. So that's uh, the history of it in a nutshell. Uh, that act and, and the corresponding state uh, statutes has two branches. It says that um, if either uh, there is irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, then the person is dead. So that's the essence of the Uniform Determination of Death Act. Let me back up just a little bit uh, on this Uniform Law Commission is the idea that that's the source of a template, that's a recommendation? Right. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So we have the Uniform Determination of Death Act, and it's, it's not as if it's something from the legislature, it's something proposed by a uniform law commission. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's not a law, it's a, it's a suggestion for- law. Right, right, okay. Now you mentioned Kansas. People try to avoid mentioning Kansas, but Mario is from Kansas. So in honor of the Kansas reference, I'm going to ask Mario to push our discussion along. I know we've got a little bit of the framework in place. Okay, um, thank you, doctor. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned that the, there, is a, there was a need to make uniform the definition of death. What was the, let me put it in this way, if a um, state have a different definition of death, what would be the consequences of that? Well, I, I mentioned that already. Uh, uh, a patient could be alive in one state and dead in another state, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, that's actually the case now um, with uh, states. Actually, there's just one state that has a religious exemption from the neurological criterion, and that's New Jersey. Uh, that's exactly why uh, Jahai McMath uh, was taken from California to New Jersey uh, because uh, in California, she already had a death certificate 
And in New Jersey, she was treated as a living patient. Uh, so it, it makes a, a big difference. Uh, and it's not a uh, viable situation long-term across the country. Okay, um, and is is the is the brain the master integrator of the body, from which it would follow that when the brain stops functioning, the body dies. That is the disintegrate. Well, that, that was the thinking at the time of the president's commission back in 1981. So it was felt that the, as as you say the brain is the master integrator of the body um, so that even, even if some cells or organs uh, might remain viable, the body as a whole is no longer a, an organism. So it, it has died. That was the thinking at the time. Um, the basis for that thinking was that Patients who uh, had devastating brain injuries and no brain function uh, could not be supported for more than a few days. And they took that as evidence that uh, these were this disintegrating uh, corpses, essentially, uh, that were temporarily uh, maintained uh, because of the life support. Um, and people don't like to call it life support in that context because they, uh, they feel that the patient isn't alive. So they call it organ support. Um, but that was uh, the thinking then. Uh, subsequently, it became clear that um, this was a false premise because as intensive care improved, more and more of these patients could be sustained for a long time. And uh, by 1998, uh, when I published a paper on this, uh, I collected over 175 cases of uh, brain death diagnosis where the patient survived more than a week. And some of those uh, survived for months and the, the record survived for 20 and a half years in that, in that condition. Uh, now that may not be a desirable condition to be kept uh, going in, but the point is uh, these were not disintegrating corpses. They were living severely disabled uh, human beings. And so the, the premise that uh, was behind the Uniform Determination of Death Act in 1981 turned out to be false. Uh, so people uh, since then have been debating uh, if there might be other rationales for salvaging the neurological criterion of death, besides this uh, organism as a whole rationale. And the main contenders for that are that uh, death is the irreversible loss of consciousness. And it doesn't matter whether the organism is living or not. Uh, so this is a kind of psychological rationale or personhood rationale. Um, and that is a radical redefinition of human life. Uh, it, if that were the case, then uh, any permanently unconscious person would be considered legally dead. Uh, therefore, the concept of uh, uh, a permanent coma would be even an oxymoron. Uh, so 
that affects many, many more patients than uh, so-called brain death currently affects. Uh, and I don't think society is ready to go that route. Uh, another <coughs> contender is um, the combination of irreversible loss of consciousness and irreversible loss of breathing. And this is essentially the UK uh, concept of death. And uh, a, a third one was proposed by the uh, US President's Council on Bioethics in 2008. And it's what's called the vital work uh, rationale. Uh, the President's Council accepted uh, the critique that uh, at least some brain dead patients uh, are living human organisms. But they still uh, defended the concept of brain death uh, by a novel rationale, which was uh, that what is critical or essential to human life is the what they called the commerce with the environment, the goal-driven exchange uh, with the environment of oxygen, of nutrients, and so on. And um, they felt that anybody without permanently without consciousness and without breathing uh, lacked this goal-driven exchange with the environment and therefore was dead. So uh, the, the debate continues and uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, the Uniform Law Commission is now in the process of uh, considering whether to revise the 1981 recommendations. Um, and they will be considering uh, these alternative rationales. Christopher, it looks like we have consistencies uh, and inconsistencies, maybe some consistent motivation and some inconsistent testing. Uh, I don't know if you want to pursue that angle or you want to dig some more where we've been. Well, I, I'm curious. I, I think we, we on the show here are probably have some sense of what the whole parameters of this discussion are. What is being, what would be, what would our guests, what would the rest of us say what is the alternative or the, what are we proposing or proposing anything as to, to determine, as a determination of what constitutes human life in this case? What are the, what are the criteria that are that proposed here in, co in contradiction and contrast with the, um, what we've been talking about? Uh, well, uh, I've proposed for many years now that um, it would be helpful to distinguish two senses of the concept death. And I, I really think that uh, a lot of the impasse in these debates over the decades is due to people using the same word for two different concepts. And our English language, unfortunately, gives us just that one word, death. Uh, other languages uh, have more than one word for that, and, and they can uh, discuss these uh, differences in a more nuanced fashion than we can in English. But uh, let's uh, back up and note that even before the advent of ICUs and uh, ventilators, when doctors declared death uh, in a hospital setting, or maybe they were in the patient's home if they paid a home visit and the patient died, uh, the doctor would put the time of death to be the time when circulation and breathing 
stopped, permanently stopped. Now, nobody had a problem with that timing of the moment of death. But if you were to talk to a theologian or a uh, philosopher and said, uh, when is the moment of death? Well, that would be when the soul uh, leaves the body. And the timing of that is unknown. Uh, we can tell that the soul has left the body in, uh, if there are such signs as rigor mortis or liver mortis and so on. But nobody can say exactly when that metaphysical moment occurs. Nobody had a problem with the fact that uh, death certificates had a time of death that did not correspond to metaphysical death. So, and I think that's a, a very useful distinction because uh, society uh, has to have some uh, clear criterion whether someone is a member of it or not. So uh, when someone dies, uh, you know, their spouse becomes a widow or a widower. Uh, life insurances kick in. If it's the president of the United States, the vice president becomes president. Um, and people start grieving. And family members begin to grieve at that moment. Uh, so there are all sorts of consequences of the uh, timing of what we could call civil death, if you will, which is, which is not to be equated with metaphysical or ontological death, but is nevertheless an important and useful concept. So I have maintained that an optimal criterion for civil death is the permanent cessation of circulation of oxygenated blood. And we just don't have a good criterion for the uh, moment of metaphysical or ontological death. All we can say is whether, uh, we can say for sure that it has happened if certain signs are present. And uh, otherwise, we have to be agnostic about it. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And I, I, yeah, I think it's curious is that what the, that, the definition you give for civil death is very clear. Why depart from that? Why depart from the older standard? to a newer standard. So what's behind that? The, the newer standard meaning the neurological uh, the brain death, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, uh, I would say the motivation uh, for the past 50 years has been transplantation. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you wait until cessation of circulation of oxygenated blood, then a lot of vital organs uh, are not going to be suitable for transplantation. Uh, but if you have uh, a, a patient whose brain is destroyed, but whose heart is beating fine and all the other organs are working fine, then that's an ideal candidate for transplantation. Hmm. So that's really the motivation. Uh, now, the demise of the concept of brain death doesn't necessarily mean the demise of transplantation, uh, because uh, we have a precedent of uh, transplantation from living donors, uh, for example, blood bone marrow, uh, a single kidney, a lobe of a liver. Uh, these things can be donated from living donors uh, 
with obviously with informed consent about the risks and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, that principle, I think, can, can also apply to uh, patients who have, whose heart has just stopped. And is, one, once it's clear that it's not going to start up again, uh, then that, that principle could apply to uh, using those organs because extracting them is not going to change at all the physiological process of, of dying. Uh, so th there's a whole field uh, of transplantation based on uh, non-heart beating donors. It's also called uh, donation after circulatory death. Uh, and people argue whether this is really death or not um, but I, I would say that that argument is uh, based on conflating the two concepts of death. Uh, of course, it's not metaphysical death, but if you define civil death in terms of permanent cessation of circulation of oxygenated blood, then those patients can be declared dead. What are some cases as you look back uh, at your practice, uh, what are some cases that have really helped shape your own thinking? Well, these cases are not in my practice, uh, but- Your consulting uh, practice. They're not in my consulting practice either. Ah, uh, your research practice. <laughs> research practice, yes. Uh, so, well, the, the uh, most striking case, uh, I mentioned this uh, boy who survived 20 and a half years in the state of brain death. Uh, he uh, became uh, brain dead at age four from meningitis. And his mother didn't accept that he was dead. And this was also at a time before there were diagnostic criteria apl applicable to young children. So the doctors were reluctant to apply the uh, uh, President's Commission criteria or the Harvard criteria or any other criteria to this young boy. So he was supported in the ICU and um, amazingly, uh, Eventually, he was discharged home, and he stayed home on a mechanical ventilator and nursing support and uh, tube feedings for 20 and a half years. <clears throat> uh, when he died, uh, finally, um, they did an autopsy, and, and the, uh, there was no brain tissue inside the head. So... It was clearly not a matter of misdiagnosis. Uh, he really had no brain function because he had no brain. Uh, yet his, his organism survived that long because it was an organism as a whole. So I think that and uh, there are other less dramatic but uh, nevertheless uh, impressive cases of prolonged survival in the state of brain death. About the uh, case of the young woman who was transferred to New Jersey. Uh, her case is remarkable for a different reason. So she, uh, uh, there was no question about the application of the diagnostic criteria for her. Uh, some of these chronic cases uh, have been questioned whether they were really correctly diagnosed. Uh, in Jahai McMath's case, uh, she clearly fulfilled the diagnostic criteria and 
even uh, there was a court appointed independent neurologist who came and it repeated all the examinations a couple of weeks later and uh, con concurred that she uh, did meet the diagnostic criteria of brain death. She had four EEGs, all of which were flat. And she had a uh, blood flow test, which showed no blood flow to the brain. So uh, by, uh, by any standard, she was uh, properly declared brain dead and was given a death certificate in California. Um, in New Jersey, she developed menstrual periods. So she was 13 years old at the time and had not yet had her period. Um, but while brain dead, or supposedly brain dead, uh, she developed uh, menstruation and had three menstrual periods altogether. Uh, so that's in itself quite remarkable because here's uh, a body that is supposed to be a corpse yet is menstruating. She also went through puberty and developed uh, uh, the secondary sexual characteristics. And after several months uh, of being in New Jersey, her family started to note or to suspect that she was aware of them and was able to follow simple commands sometimes. Uh, as time went on, they became more and more convinced of this. And since they knew that nobody would believe them, uh, they made videos of testing sessions where they asked her to move her thumb or move her left arm or her right foot. And many times she would do that in the videos. Uh, I became very interested in her case uh, after they began to report these uh, phenomena that were really inconsistent with a diagnosis of brain death. And uh, they entrusted to me uh, over 50 videos. Uh, and I've done a statistical analysis of those videos. And there's uh, no way that you can explain these movements as uh, chance occurrences of uh, random, spontaneous, involuntary movements that just happen to occur after uh, commands. They're, they're too specific to the body part and they occur too soon after the command. Uh, so, here is somebody who uh, demonstrates that the diagnostic criteria that are used uh, throughout the country are not foolproof. And so that's, that's a whole uh, different issue from the conceptual one, whether brain death is death. Uh, this case has to do with whether the diagnostic criteria that are currently standard adequately diagnose whether the brain is irreversibly non-functional. So I, I think uh, Jahai's case and some others that have been published, uh, one of them uh, by myself, uh, show that there are false positive uh, diagnoses uh, even following the most rigorous accepted standards. Mario, we've got uh, conceptual problems. We've got uh, clinical surprises. What, what thoughts do you have at this point? 
Um, there is, um, I read the, reread the statement by John Paul II in 2000. And it seems to me, correct if I'm wrong, that he was um, making the distinction between what we may call metaphysical death and physical death. But yet he says uh, that the death is the death of the person, is a single event. And that single event, yes, what is happening is that the soul separate from the body. And you cannot perceive, we cannot perceive that with our senses, but yet we do through biological signs, which follow the death, that single event. And then we decide which one of these criteria, whether uh, the criteria you're describing or brain dead were the one that certified death. Now, um, do you think then, if that is uh, the case, um, the statement or the, I don't know, the the criterion of uh, irreversible cessation, all function of the entire brain should be revised or the neurological criterion should be revised in favor of a circulatory respiratory criterion of that. Well, um, there's several reasons for parts to your question. Yes. Going, going back to uh, the uh, address of Pope John Paul II in, in 2000, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that he was making a distinction between uh, what I've been calling civil death and, and metaphysical death. He was, he was talking about metaphysical death uh, when the soul... Uh, leaves the body. And <clears throat> uh, he was very careful in, in his choice of words in that statement. Uh, he deferred to the scientific community to uh, provide the uh, physical signs for when death has occurred. Uh, and he said that the uh, there, there is a, a widespread consensus uh, about a neurological criterion and that uh, this criterion does not seem to conflict with uh, a sound Christian anthropology. And, and the word seem uh, was his original word in his statement. Uh, so, of course, it did not seem that way to him uh, because the information that was given to him was provided by the uh, international scientific community uh, through his consultants. And uh, clearly, there is a favoring of a neurological criterion on the part of the international community. Uh, but as, as I've explained, uh, that uh, the, the rationale behind that uh, in terms of cessation of the organism as a whole is no longer a viable rationale. Uh, and the rationales that are now being proposed, uh, if uh, Pope John Paul II could look at those now and assess them, I think he would say that they do seem to conflict with the sound Christian anthropology, especially the consciousness-based uh, notion. So um, people who supported 
the idea of brain death uh, around 2000, we're very pleased with uh, the statement that he made. Uh, but it was a conditional statement. And uh, the Holy Father certainly uh, was interested in ongoing investigations into the scientific uh, underpinnings of neurological concept of death. And in fact, uh, he encouraged the Pontifical Academy of Sciences to hold uh, a third working group to hear the other side of the argument regarding brain death. Uh, and that group convened in 2005. So there had been uh, previous working groups uh, uh, in uh, the late 1990s. And uh, so clearly the, the fact that Pope John Paul uh, wanted uh, this to be further studied indicated that uh, he considered the, the scientific aspects of it uh, still open to discussion. And rightly so. Uh, and at that meeting, there were uh, multiple presentations providing evidence that uh, brain death or, or cessation of brain functions did not correspond to human death. Um, interestingly, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, uh, which uh, very much favored the notion of brain death, uh, did what it could to suppress that meeting and did not, did not publish its uh, proceedings and uh, essentially deleted its occurrence from its uh, archives and its calendar and had a, a yet another meeting after that in 2006 uh, where uh, the consultants were sort of handpicked to uh, support the notion of brain death until Pope Benedict uh, insisted that uh, uh, Robert Spayman and myself also uh, <laughs> be on that uh, working group. Uh, but the um, and it was a foregone conclusion that that working group would come out in favor of, of a neurological criterion of death. So um, when Pope Benedict addressed a transplant uh, society, and I think it was two thousand eight. Uh, he did not uh, endorse the concept of neurological criterion of death, but rather he, he said that uh, he insisted that the donors of vital organs uh, be cadavers, ex cadavere in Latin. Um, and I think what he uh, diplomatically uh, did not say uh, speaks louder than, than words uh, in, in the context of this debate. So, um, you know, the, the church uh, magisterium uh, certainly has not uh, made any statement in favor of a neurological criterion of death, uh, nor is it in its competence to do so. It, it is competent to declare what uh, kind of concepts of death are consistent with Christian anthropology, but uh, it lacks the competence to say what medical criteria correspond with that concept. We want to uh, trust science insofar as it's really science. And we want to trust scientists insofar as they're really practicing science. And we want to make decisions that are evidence-based insofar as they are based on the actual evidence. 
there are some distinctions to draw here, are there not? Absolutely. And you can trust uh, mainstream media to report on all of these things as they actually are. You can trust science editors, say, in the New York Times, or maybe not. Well, um, I certainly trust science, but I'm, I, I don't trust every, everyone who uh, uh, publishes a uh, paper in a scientific journal. Since some of them have to be retracted. Uh, yes, and, and many of them are, are um, motivated by philosophies that masquerade as science. Could you tell us, and, and this is a sort of an aside, but I had thought to ask you this uh, privately. Could you tell us a bit about Robert Schwebein? He's always been one of my philosophy heroes. Well, um, he was a, a German philosopher, uh, a personalist philosopher. Uh, who passed away uh, a few years ago. Sadly. Sadly, yes. Although at an advanced age. At a very advanced age, absolutely. Uh, and he wrote um, many articles, uh, mostly in German, um, but um, uh, many important articles uh, affirming the intrinsic value of human life at all stages. Someone, um, not something. Exactly, exactly. And uh, just as he defended the, the uh, human personhood of the embryo, uh, likewise he did of patients with devastating neurological injuries, including uh, total brain destruction. Uh, that these, these are uh, irreversibly comatose patients, but they are nevertheless living human patients. Uh, There's a distinction between the subject of the person, uh, the substance that is a person, and consciousness. Absolutely. Some, uh, something has to be conscious. It's, it presupposes it's a positive. That's, that's right. Christopher, join us, please. Sure. Um, it's interesting we're talking about the something, the someone, but isn't this really at the root of the problem? The problem is not so much what medical criteria you use, that's sort of the effect. The problem is, is that it seems that those who, um, at least many of the people who are proposing, you know, the brain death criteria, they have a philosophical way of looking at what a human person is. And they look upon them as a material thing. So it sort of makes sense if you if you look at it that way that, well, to be what we all value as human life is no longer possible for them. So at that point, why would you keep them alive? Um, but if you hold that there's something more to man than just his, his material body, but that there's a principle within him, a spiritual principle, um, then the whole parameters of the discussion change, it seems. And isn't that what the problem ultimately is, is how do we define what this creature we call man is? Is he merely a, a very highly advanced um, animal, or is he something more than an advanced animal? No, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, that, that is the core of the uh, debate. And uh, people who focus on, on consciousness as the, the essence of uh, what it is to be human um, have a very different worldview uh, from what you and Jim and uh, I endorse, uh, namely that the, uh, there's a substance, uh, the person is a, a living substance and cannot be reduced to the functions. Uh, there may be some obstacle to the exercise of uh, of those functions, but that doesn't mean that the substance is no longer there. So um, you, you're right. M many people who 
propose the consciousness rationale are materialists uh, who think that consciousness, uh, first of all, is just a product of brain activity and does not involve any kind of immaterial intellectual soul. And uh, as materialists, they, they reduce uh, the, the, uh, the human being to uh, this set of functions. And, and if a key function is missing, then in their mind, there's no longer a human being. So that's a, a very different worldview from ours that accepts the notion of a substance. I'm sure uh, uh, you philosophers could explain this much better than I could. It, I'm not so can, sure, but Mario, please, we're can coming we, close. Can, can we say then, according to what you are saying, that the problem of science is a philosophical problem? Well, no, the problem of science, if, if science uh, would stick to its proper domain, then that's not a philosophical problem. It's an well, but you, are, but, but, but you are saying that um, scientists will follow the way that they reason according to their view of the human person. And the view of the human person is a philosophical problem. Right. But when, so when, might... they, when they talk about that, they're talking not as scientists, but as armchair philosophers. Uh, I understand that. But what, what I'm saying is that if I have a starting point, a theory how I know, and from that follows or flows my view of the human person, and based on that, I do science. It seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that philosophy precede science. Therefore, science is a philosophical problem. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether we're agreeing or disagreeing about this. Well, culture is a topic for uh, for philosophy, so also is science a topic for philosophy. Sure, and the, there's philosophy of science. But I mean, when scientists do science, they're doing experiments and they have hypotheses and they test them uh, in uh, rigorous ways. I mean, that's doing science. Uh, so, uh, and like anybody else, a scientist can uh, have ideas about uh, what is human nature and so on, but that's not doing science. Are those are those ideas perhaps um, ineradicable? I, that you can't expect a scientist to actually do a simple science without some kind of presupposition of what he's what he's what he's looking at. Yeah. Well, I. Um, yeah, of course, the uh, scientist has a worldview behind everything because uh, everybody has a worldview. Uh, so, but I, I don't think that would or should uh, affect how he does proper science in, in mm -hmm. his laboratory. I have uh, one last question for you. It's rather general. Uh, You've had a lot of support for the statement that you've authored, and it's come from some surprising sources. I saw the name Peter Singer. I saw that name right there. I was surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, are you pleased with the amount of support you've had? Did you anticipate that much? Are you surprised at some of the people who have supported your intervention? Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased, uh, of course. Uh, I'm not entirely surprised because in my discussions with colleagues over the years, I know there are uh, a lot of people 
uh, who are uh, not satisfied with the current UDDA uh, uh, for different reasons. And um, there are a lot of people who are concerned about the diagnostic accuracy of the uh, brain death criteria of the, uh, the, that are standard across the country. Um, so I, I must say I wasn't surprised by the uh, number of supporters of, of uh, this statement. But, uh, but I am pleased by the diversity of opinions uh, that they represent. Uh, and uh, I think it, it shows the, uh, the strength of, uh, of this whole effort uh, that, that it, there are supporters from uh, quite a wide variety of opinions about human nature and death and ethics and so on. So uh, dialogue has proved effective. Well, uh, yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> That's good to know, good to know. All right, on, on that positive note, uh, we'll close with today's gospel as we always do. And, and of course, thank you so much, Dr. Schumann, for joining us. You're welcome. This is from Luke. At that time, John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, are you or the one who is to come or should we look for another? When the men came to the Lord, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? At that time, Jesus cured many of their diseases, sufferings, and evil spirits. He also granted sight to many who were blind. And Jesus said to them in reply, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, Lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Mario. You. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you.